Hello and welcome to Catholic Unscripted episode 8. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. Well, I was at Mass this week at uh, Corpus Christi in Maiden Lane with Cardinal Sarrar, and it was a really beautiful Mass. Mark, you, you, your friends were there too. I met uh, your friend Anna, you introduced us. And it was... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and what a fantastic thing. She took some students up, didn't she, from a, the Catholic school that she works at. And you have to think that it would be such a, an amazing formative experience for those young people to get to meet um, such a holy man. Um, she that, and they were very lucky that um, Father Allen took them to meet the Cardinal after the Mass. So that they were absolute. She was on cloud nine afterwards. And I, I always think that those that, those sort of things are so important that you get to, you know, if you can get to something like that beautiful liturgy, uh, hear someone as powerful and um, as holy as Cardinal Seurat, give a homily and then get to meet him afterwards. Well, it's just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it was really beautiful. The liturgy was beautiful. He spoke um, with such depth such power and um he spoke about the importance of confession about the sacrament of confession which you you just don't hear that much about 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 the importance of receiving um the body of christ into this um vessel that is clean you know that that you don't you don't just get a grubby old vessel and then pour beautiful wine in because it will it will sort of mix and make it make it unclean. And so he spoke about this and and I thought this was such an important message. And I was there with my son um, and there were a few young people there. And it was so lovely because he 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 was just still throughout the whole mass and spoke afterwards about how how beautiful he found it. And, and then Cardinal Sarah was absolutely hounded. People were crowding around him um, and he was blessing everybody. And he had such there was such a sanctity about him. Um, he was so patient and he gave my son a little bit of time and signed, <laughs> gave his autograph and, and blessed him. And we, we, we came away and just felt, you know, it was just a really positive experience. Just, just really beautiful. And a reminder of, you know, the, the truth of our faith and, 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 and why it's so good, why it's so beautiful, why it's so true. It's really lovely. Yeah. It's, I think father, all. Oh thanks and power to Father Alan Robinson, really, who's the parish priest at Corpus Christi. Not only has he restored the shrine to absolute magnificence, yeah. it's such a beautiful place to go to Mass. Yeah. Um, but also he regularly has special liturgies. I was there not so long ago. Uh, Father Lawrence Liu, the Dominican, um, said the Dominican rite. Um, it was absolutely just, and it's always great to go up to, to the city you always run into friends and, you know, maybe even have a sneaky pint afterwards. <laughs> so, um, but it's wonderful that Father Alan does that and um, yeah. to bring over such a, I mean, potentially it could be a future Pope. He's, he's 77 now, so he can't mm. vote in the, in the next conclave, but he could be elected. So, um, and, and it's funny, a number of clergy have said to me this week, oh, if he was Pope, you know, it'd be absolutely fantastic. And it would be because you can see that the reaction of everyone who was there that to a holy man, you know, the way that yeah. people, we want leaders, people to lead us in holiness. And, you know, he's, he is like that. He's absolutely brilliant. God bless him. Yeah, well, let's hope, let's continue to hope and pray uh, that, that, that hopefully he can be. And you talked about the church there, which is indeed beautiful. And I think it's that access point we've spoken before of beauty, you know, you, it's really impossible to be there, to hear the choir sing, to to be in the presence of the incense and not be and not access God through beauty. It's in, in the middle of London, in the middle of this bustling street full of pubs and bars. It's really it's really beautiful. Oh, and so we go from there in contrast to uh, to Ireland this week, where a priest, Father Sean Sheehy, uh, a visiting priest, um, gave a homily where he talked of sin and warned of the eternal consequences and said people won't like what I'm saying and one of the people who didn't like what he was saying was the local bishop Ray Brown who issued a statement condemning Sheehy for his homily saying that he's aware of the deep hurt caused by it and get this that the views expressed do not represent the Christian position. Why are the bishops Gavin apologizing for the faith 
This is the most incredible moment. I mean, a moment in European history, which I think is without precedent at all. <clears throat> the fact that so many, so many Catholic bishops should do this. Uh, the first Anglican bishop has just broken cover to say that he's in favor of gay marriage against the church's teaching. And this is in fact the usual strategy, <laughs> one that is being followed by parts of the Catholic church, of course, too. Uh, and, and gay testing the waters, others will follow him rapidly. <clears throat> but the Catholic Church is some way behind. Nonetheless, what Father Sheehy has done is to precipitate, I think, the crisis in a remarkable way. And we should probably be grateful because it's really quite important that the, the things should be br brought to the surface and brought to the light. So what you actually had was a Catholic bishop saying um, that the, parent, the priest who, in a quite reasonable and rather rather fetching and kind way he's got a very nice face by the way he's a nice man and uh, the whole thing was set in the context of i want you all to go to heaven i want you all to have forgiveness and grace and the love of god but if i don't tell you this i'm accountable to god uh, and so is the church so let me tell you this um, some people walked out other people applauded so here we have the division of the wheat and the tares earlier than we thought um, but a large number of clergy and of and of bishops have bought into the this new religion which has been slowly growing uh, which is based on two ideas it's based on uh, niceness and the eradication of evil and the way this works is uh, and I, I remember not everyone will know that for about um, i'm trying to write an article about it for about 20 years i was a pro lgbt activist um and i bought in and i and remember i remember how i got there and why i got there I remember thinking my, the people who come to church on a Sunday who I don't want to lose badly need encouraging in their belief of God, which is very primitive. And the best way to encourage them is to tell them that God is nice and God likes them. And God accepts them as they are because we were competing with the therapists <laughs> who are all saying you are nice and you're acceptable as you are. Uh, and, and in the name of the, the sort of the therapeutic value. Uh, and so as Christians, the church, in order to keep people, had to had to be at least as enthusiastic and as polemic as the therapists in saying, God is nice, God accepts you as you are. Now, the problem is there's, there's, there's a next step in Christianity, which is God does accept you as you are, but he wants to change you because God is more than nice, he's, he's holy. And this step takes a great deal of courage. And if you're, if you're in a community where people are not going to church or they're hanging on by the skin of their teeth, or you're not really sure you've got their hearts, or they're not properly converted, or they haven't had the Holy Spirit, then, then it's a very difficult move to go from God is nice to God is holy. And God accepts as you are to God wants you to repent and to change you further. So I can understand that very well, um, because it was that God is nice that moved me into wanting to affirm all broken LGBT community with, with love and acceptance. But alongside this goes another theological point, which is absolutely essential. And again, I remember how it happened as a parish priest. Every time the, the, the Sunday Missal had uh, Jesus driving out demons or Jesus preaching on hell, I remember feeling a knot in my stomach thinking, I don't know how I'm going to say this from the pulpit. I don't want to say this from the pulpit. I don't know how to tell people there really are demons and there really is a devil. And this is a very serious struggle and there really is a hell. And I don't want to tell people that that uh, they're involved in this life or death struggle. And so, and so it's so easily done. It's so easily sidestepped. And I think we have a whole generation of clergy who've made the two sidesteps that I made. And so I had to change my mind and repent uh, for other reasons. But I see how they got there. The tragedy is so many have got there and, and, and the kerfuffle, the, the repudiation of this excellent priest telling the truth to people has been truly enormous. And, you know, we've got politicians weighing in, bishops weighing in, and essentially the church has been divided right down the middle. Mm, Mark? Well, uh, I suppose the thing about it was when you listen to what he said, it's just straight out of the catechism. That's what struck me. Exactly as you said, Gavin, it wasn't, like, I was expecting it to be fire and brimstone. Um, and when I listened back to it, it was gentle, it was lovely, and it was just pure Catholic. Just, you know, I, I was listening to it thinking there's absolutely nothing in here, you know, that isn't church teaching or could, or it isn't even church teaching put in a harsh way. It's just exactly what the church teaches. And I was 
un- I just could not believe it that the bishop actually removed him from ministry for it. Yeah. Um, and and that statement that you know you you read out there, Catherine, so, like well, someone needs to have a word with this bishop, and they what, what's going on in the church, where you get removed for preaching the gospel, and but you know you can as long as if you're on the side of evil and sin, then absolutely no problem, you get promoted. Yeah, it's <clears throat> Father She. He said, "You don't admonish the sinner out of a sense of superiority." but out of a sense of love. And as Gavin said, it's exactly right. And on uh, similarly to Gavin, my, my background, I can speak on a personal level of, of what that's like when you think you know everything, you think you've got the world sussed out, you think you've, you know, you don't judge anybody, everybody be free to do what they want. And I encountered somebody who challenged me on that and it was hard to hear. And I didn't like it and I was angry and I walked away and my conscience was un- was disturbed. Um, and I, <clears throat> I think now, this was a long journey, but I think now about that, meeting that person who a- approached me with the truth and how resistant I was to it, but how thankful I am that I continued to um, interact with this person, to listen to what they had to say. And the truth is that right now, my children who are in their teenage years and who love Christ and his church, and they're just such a great gift, such a blessing. It, if this person hadn't persevered with me and shown me the truth um, and suffered for it, which he surely did, then the, my my son could easily be wondering whether he was a girl. My girl wouldn't know what was up and down. I was very much in that world. And so generations of, of people are, are, this is really important stuff. You know, uh, my life has been transformed. Yes, it's God who did it, but he used a vessel. He uses vessels and we have to be open to that. And we have to have the courage to speak in love, in charity, uh, uh, truth, because it changes people and then it changes their children and then their grandchildren. And so this is hugely important. I thought he was brilliant. I thought he spoke truth in a loving way. And, you know, the whole reason a a surgeon hates cancer is out of his love for the patient's health. He hates it. He wants to get rid of it. And this is the attitude. It's out of love for you that I speak to you because I don't want you to end up suffering this eternal punishment. So absolutely, I think the bishop should have supported him and said, this is really basic, simple Christian teaching. And I don't know why he didn't. No, it's amazing, isn't it? You but know, I, it's... I think it's 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 interesting that um, this is a this has been developing for a long while in Ireland, um, where you've got a situation where uh, there are lots of factors involved that have created a sort of a milieu, which has resulted in a mass apostasy, basically. Uh, and I've seen it because my family, uh, you know, half my family are Irish, mm. and. Um, that you know it's 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 not right and it's not fair that some of these things have happened the abuse crisis certainly had a massive effect on you know i know look, look, look from a personal perspective the male members of my own family just couldn't reconcile the fact that this was going on um in a church that you know claimed to be about what it what the church claims to be about and as a man myself i understand that um i think coupled with that that they had their own experiences when they were at school, um, you know, a lot of the schools were run by religious and they were quite harsh. There was a lot of beatings dished out. Um, and, that be, and a lot of that is to do with the fact that there were a lot of, I mean, it'd be interesting to see what the comments, what comments we get on this episode, because I'm sure this is a lot of people have got uh, opinions about this sort of thing. Um, and a lot of people will know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, where there was a high, like high level of clericalism in Ireland. Um, I remember stories that I've heard from different parts of Ireland where um, the, the parish priest would stand up and read out the collection, who gave what in the collection, in an attempt to, you know, embarrass people who didn't give enough money. Um, uh, just horrible, horrible things. Where, and uh, I think the people were very poor, in, you know, certainly in the west of Ireland where my family are from, and uh, the priests were all treated like, you know, superhumans. 
and they were allowed to do whatever they liked. And, you know, unfortunately, it led to abuse on on every level. And so this is, you know, the land of saints and scholars, it used to be, that evangelised the rest of the world, but they've got no vocations, they've got nothing now. And as a result of that, the bishops are all running scared, as are the priests. I think the only reason this priest was able to speak out is because he lived in America or Canada and he retired back home to Kerry, where he was from, and bought his own house and everything. So he's not dependent on the bishop to feed and house him. So that's given him the opportunity to basically be honest, you know. And from what I hear, there's a lot of clergy in Ireland who feel the same way, who would support um, the things that, that Father Shee said, but they're terrified of being kicked out of their... We see this all the time in America. It's going on more and more often um, as this strange sort of culture apostasy takes hold. It's really interesting. And I don't really know what the answer is, except for us. I mean, you can see how viral it's gone. It's all it's been on Fox News and everything. This little story that from, you know, the back end of County Kerry, which is <laughs> it just shows the passion like that people could see the injustice in the way that this priest was treated that people still care about the faith and I think you know I you know I always think about that painting um by Caravaggio um Our Lady of Loretto you know where you've got the the, the, the pilgrims kneeling down before and being blessed by our, our blessed mother and it's the dirty feet of the church is the image I don't know if you're familiar with the image and like basically that Caravaggio was very sort of, uh, you know, focused on the normal people. And he was saying that it's the normal people who carry the church. And I think we're seeing that now. Mm. We're seeing these guys who are in privileged positions. They lack the intellect uh, for the office that they're, they've been graced with. And they really haven't got any idea about what they're doing. You know, I'd love to have a conversation with Bishop Brett and, and to find out exactly what was going on in his head. I'm sure he thinks exactly as you said, Gavin, that it's all about being nice to people. You, wonder, you said we don't know what the answer is, but actually um, Catherine gave us the answer at the beginning, and I, which I think we'll recognise. It's Cardinal Sarah. It's the holiness. And, and so what we have here is we have holiness and sin. Mark is quite right. Um, clericalism and, uh, and child abuse are two... Well, it's impossible to find the word. They're so scourges, awesome. and they're, they're the reason why the church has lost the re yes, they're, and they're the reason why the church has lost the right to speak as a church. But of course, we're not just speaking as an institution. Um, what what she he did was to simply offer the catechism, offer Catholic truth. So the church as an institution has lost the right to speak to people through misbehaviour and sin, definitely. So what it needs to do is to re is, is not to lose all confidence and just try and retain some scrabbling foothold um, and ask, asking people to turn the other eye to their memories. It's got to repent and it's got to say, look, we, we repent of the clericalism, we repent of the dreadful clerical superiority. In one sense, Pope Francis is almost right. Uh, you know, the, the, you could take the rigidity he's talking about to be that really horrible shit on your head clericalism that we've all experienced from mm. pharisaical clergy it's it's a travesty of christianity the church needs to say yes. sorry for that there's no way it can say sorry adequately for for the pedophile priests but it has to go on saying sorry but again it isn't it's it, it's it's and again I'm to watch my language they're being protected by the hierarchy in rome mm. and this is beyond disgusting and you know the, the church has yet as an institution to learn that it has to repent and to be changed. So this then makes life very difficult. And no wonder in a sense, partly because I think people have a sense that these blemishes are there. There's another reason to try and go for nice. Please accept us because you know, we, we're, we're well-meaning after all, not well-meaning enough to repent and to cleanse the stables. I think that, um, so what she has done is to say, this is, the faith of the, uh, this is the faith of Christ. This is the teaching of Christ. This is Jesus came to warn us about sin and judgment and heaven and hell. And there's no way of reading the Gospels without taking evil into it and, and the struggle between evil and good into account. There is no way of take, reading the Gospels without taking the demonic infestation into account that Jesus drove out. I have no doubt at all that, that, um, that, that the church in Ireland is infested with some form of spiritual pollution that will only disappear when there's real 
repentance because it takes repentance to do that so the answer is holiness and the moment you find someone like sarah where you have authentic christianity or mother Teresa of calcutta where you have an authentic relationship with jesus that's the answer so it's beholden upon the rest of us to look at the vices of the church and to try and free ourselves from them by praying and by being penitent and, and pursuing holiness and then when people do that they'll discover something real and um, just one more thing i want to say so those are the vices and virtues of the church there are vices and virtues to the whole gay movement and and because this is a public platform i'll need to choose my language carefully but but the idea that love is love is the most dreadfully misleading statement i saw something on twitter saying love is love unless it's love of god and your country in which case it's right-wing patriarchal fascism and so <laughs> um uh, the, the 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 love that is supposedly at the heart of self of same of self of same sex attractive people um is is not always the beautiful and pure thing that it is indeed it's it's much more complex than that and and essentially one's being faced with two kinds of love one that is really at root eroticized and romantic and the problem with erotic and romantic love is it burns itself out it's like dogs chasing their tail a whole society is like a dog chasing its tail the tail is personal happiness set in a romantic and erotic setting it never catches it there are no happy people in that sense um falling in love and going to bed with people doesn't make you happy for very long it makes you happy for a bit and then there are consequences but finding the love of god makes you happy forever and changes who you are and we should have much more confidence in saying that that niceness and holiness are not the same thing one is is a shimmerer one is pretense niceness will not get you through forgiveness and judgment holiness will and erotic and romantic love will vaporize and let you down but but caritas agape won't and we have to find the courage to make the distinction that the language that's being used in our society has been deliberately trying to obscure very well said i i think it's really important that we're able to articulate this clearly um and from an intellectual base as well um and i think the key difference is in the type of relationships you know it's like this equality the idea of equality is that um you know people should be able to have that everyone should have access to marriage or whatever like it's a product that they're being denied rather than a sacrament and a sacrifice and if we understood that marriage is a sacrifice it's, you know the, the the level of commitment as we reduce that level of commitment so it's like and still in instead of promising yourself uh, you know your whole entire being until you you know irrespective of what happens to you in sickness and in health now it's until i'm fed up with you isn't it like the, <laughs> if you go to a civil service it's like you know oh, i'll promise to be married to you until i don't want to be anymore <laughs> and, and it's so it, it's it's a, just not the same thing there's there's a lack of parity there in any case and it's that's not to belittle or um to try and denigrate the power of you know um emotional connection that two human beings can feel um irrespective of of any other factors but mm -hmm. i think what's important is that we put that sacrificial that, that real love agape love is sacrificial in mm -hmm. essence and that when we have to think what are we doing how are we acting are we acting for the best interest of the other person and it's in learning that that is the most important thing that really love is transformative power in in the world and in our lives isn't it so and i, and I think we need to speak about this can, can, can i butt in again please do yeah i've kind of run out of stuff I'm, I'm, anyway. I'm, 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 i've got a train beautiful. of thought, thought i'm trying not to lose but, but it's, it's your turn catherine no go I'll, go go it's it's not then it's my train of thought i'm trying not to lose <laughs> Go. Well, I was listening to um, someone sent me a, a link of, of all the radio programs, and, and I've been listening to uh, Irish journalists really hammering um, she. Uh, and, and one of them said, "I've just been sent an email by by this man. Let's call him Ray. And Ray has said he lost his husband recently, and he's very upset because he hears she saying that his husband's gone to hell." What have you got to that? say to that, said the Irish journalist to the priest he was interviewing. And of course, the priest funked it completely. And I thought about this for a bit because this was a deeply moving thing. And, and it's highly problematic. Death, love um, and, and, and the categories of relationship. 
And I thought, well, well, once again, we're being bamboozled. And I'm, I'm going to try and say something that's really quite difficult now. And it's, it's to do with the mechanics of making love. Uh, in a previous episode, we, we fought shy of the spirituality of Teresa of Avila because I didn't want to go down this route. But, but we need to try it for a moment. So the, the, the notion, neither the act of making love between heterosexuals, which can be animalistic at one end or angelic at the other almost, uh, is, is, involves the fusion of a man and a woman. The physical fusion of it and it can be animalistic which is not which is not so profound but at the spiritual level the self-giving and the fusion of men and women is a very very profound experience um, and it isn't replicated by gay men and gay women gay men and gay women cannot biologically experience this fusion they're doing something different um it's not it's not very good for male bottoms actually there's an epidemic of, of damaged male bottoms i'm really sorry to be rude but nobody ever when you know everyone says love is love doesn't talk about about the um the engineering involved in all this and it's not the same fusion of the body mm. that men that, that heterosexuals experience we should therefore be able to make a distinction as heterosexuals who believe in marriage between the act of love making, not only physically, but everything it includes metaphysically and spiritually and symbolically. This act of self-giving and fusion and immersion in the other. Because in the end, this is this leads us to a Trinitarian notion of called perico, which the early church fathers called perichoresis. And perichoresis is a Greek word called indwelling, or the or the um the, this this kind of uh the, the the barriers of being broken in two for the sake of the fusion of unity. And something happens in the act of heterosexual lovemaking, which approaches this essential paradigm of the Holy Trinity, I think. Now, you don't get many people talking about this because it's slightly embarrassing. Um, but, but if we don't talk about it, if we don't make a distinction between the lovemaking that takes place between very well motive and deeply attractive lesbians, very well motivated and deeply attractive gay men, then we're we're selling the world down uh, short because 98 percent of people are heterosexual and capable of this extraordinary experience of heterosexual love making which if it's put into the arms of god becomes more than just an erotic act of intimacy it becomes a whole spiritual journey of of the the, the changes the members of the of the marriage who are in it and because we've allowed goes back to contraception because we've allowed sex to become a kind of entertainment sport uh, a way of a way of seeking pleasure the church has failed to talk about the spiritual significance of what takes place between a man and a woman and its theological implications and really when you think about it if they are anything like what i've tried to, to, to explain so badly they are so profound and so wonderful and then the next thing even if i was wrong which i'm not it leads to the miracle of life. Yeah. And again, yeah. the, the you know, poor lesbians and poor gay men can't do this, but heterosexuals can. And it's theologically immensely profound. The fact that within marriage, a man and a woman can have this experience of unity and union, highly spiritualized as opposed to opposed to animalized, and then produce life. Well, it's mind blowing. And yet the church is not talking about it. We, we continue to talk about sex as if it's some form of entertainment exercise simply to make yourself, well, a kind of dr a drug of diversion. So what we should be doing is, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure how a bishop will be able to do this in the middle of a radio interview, but we should not allow the terms of encounter between human beings to be taken over entirely mm -hmm. by the secularists and the people for whom sex is a kind of sport mm -hmm. or an entertainment or something you do to keep yourself from hurting. I I think the um sorry. No, I was just going to say that like that's you're exactly right. The church does. Uh, this is the connection the church has always made. Casti Canubi, Humane Vitae. You can roll the documents off your tongue. It's that inviolable connection between life, openness to life, cool. and the marital act. That that's what makes it different. And as soon as you accept contraception, you know, yeah. I think we've we've talked about it before. As soon as you go down that path. And make it about physical stimulation. You know, a lot, yeah. I think I said in another episode, you're just genitalizing your relationships. Well, you know, it, it's just yeah. ridiculous. It's animalistic. It is. I, I and uh, Saint Saint Augustine uh, speaks about the, the the Trinity, the the lover, the beloved, and the relationship between mm. them: the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
And um, <clears throat> I also want to use this as an opportunity since it seems to have come, come to my mind as Gavin was speaking. Uh, I spoke with you, Gavin, this week about Catholic education uh, on your podcast. Um, I think also school uh, Catholic parents should be aware of what's happening in their schools with regard to relationships and sex education. Now, uh, my own children's school a few years ago sent an email saying that they've got a new RSE policy and it states that pupils should know that marriage represents a formal, legally recognised commitment of two people to each other, which is intended to be lifelong. And that's it. So this is a Catholic school. Well, I wrote back, I have concerns that this is an unclear and misleading definition of marriage. It's our understanding that marriage must be permanent, life-giving and exclusive, not intended to be lifelong. Uh, if the vows, if valid, constitute a permanent binding and unending covenant and new flesh, there is no mention of the procreative nature of marriage as understood in the constant teaching of the church. By this definition, given above, a brother or sister who live together and choose to remain single as constant companions afforded legal claims to inheritance and property rights must be understood as married. Whilst we recognise that marriage has been expanded and redefined in civil law to mean something else, we have entrusted our children to a Catholic school so that they might learn the truth, beauty and goodness of the faith. Marriage is ultimately the natural and proper place to have children and raise a family. It is no less than a mirror of the Trinity. In this sense, a misunderstanding of marriage will inevitably lead to a misunderstanding of God himself. And that's what I wrote to the Catholic school who told me about their new RSE policy. And I would say Catholic parents need to be aware of the subtle changes that are taking place in schools with regards to how we we deliver um, sex education. It's like religious liberty is being attacked in the name of sexual liberty. And, and it's and it's subtle and it's drip, drip, drip. So look at what's being sent home and respond. And only that way will the schools realise that Catholic parents care about their children's Catholic education. We can see how it's framed. It's a framed about exclusion, isn't it? That they yeah. don't exclude anyone. It's what we were talking about last week about big tent, yeah. you know, radical inclusion and big tent theology and all this old rubbish. <laughs> Except Father Sheehy's not welcome in the big tent. No, exactly. He's out of it. And uh, all the ex <laughs> Catholics are as well, according to the tablet this week. <laughs> yeah. We could go down that rabbit we, hole. We might, we, we might go there. <laughs> we, we, before before we do i just one, one of the ways of testing what's going on uh during this week i, I had the sadness of having uh, a, a, a gig ended i've been writing for seven years i've been writing occasional articles just once a month for the jersey evening post and they fired me this week um or let let me go and the editor says i don't want to do woke anymore you you know you we're not you're not writing for us um and so this is not exactly this is not wholly cancellation, but it is cancellation. Um, and so, so because I, I, I write about, I write mainly for a secular audience, I write about freedom of speech. And so the freedom of speech, to write about freedom of speech has been curtailed because the editor doesn't want it. Perhaps because Crazy. the people don't, don't want it. But the, but, the, but, 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 but the reason I want to, to mention that is not to ask for your pity, but, but to say that um, the people who believe in Catholic marriage, Catholic Christian marriage, uh, don't want to exclude or censor people who have got different social contractual ideas for living together. They can do what they want. We don't, we don't try and stop people talking, experimenting, living. We want to invite them into the truth and reality, but we don't want to prohibit them. That's not our interest. But they do want to prohibit us. And they are prohibiting us. And, and it's becoming clearer and clearer that if you hold this view of marriage that Catherine just articulated on behalf of the Catholic Church, well, there are all kinds of employment that you simply can't have. Well, what, what does that really mean? If you're faced with two sides, two, two movements, two energies, two philosophies, and one is prepared to cancel the other and, and stamp it out of existence, and the other is truly welcoming, we are the inclusive ones because we're willing to live alongside people trying out different ways of human beings. And they are not at all inclusive. Mm. It's a trick. It's a deceit. Mm. It's a strategy. And unfortunately, <laughs> the people we live amongst are, are, are falling for it. And I think that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, that was one why, why I really woke, wrote about woke culture, because if we don't continue this freedom of speech and freedom of thought, well, we're really stuffed. But mm. I think the Sheehy thing shows how, how very nearly stuffed we are. Absolutely. Yeah. Very good. 
OK, well, I want to end by thanking Father Sheehy for his bravery, for his courage and uh, thanking Bishop Ray Brown's dry cleaners for the starch they put in his shirt that is uh, keeping him up. So <laughs> that's it for today. I'm Catherine Bennett. I'm Mark Lambert. I'm Gavin Ashenden. Thank you for watching. Bless you.